According to a DOD report, the number of active duty suicides declined slightly from 2012 to 2013, while the number of reservists and National Guard who took their own lives increased. The reason for suicide are as varied as the individuals. Usually, experts say it's a perfect storm of events that leads to a person's death. As part of our special suicide prevention coverage this month, Corporal Jonathan Herrera takes a look at the deaths of two service members, one a Marine pilot who died nine years ago, the other an Army captain who fell in 2012. We met uh, on a Christian dating website <laughs> when I was in college and he was at West Point. But the first time I ever met him, I knew I was going to marry him and he said later the same thing. He was very funny, very sarcastic, and really, really smart, like too smart. <laughs> and uh, I don't know that I've ever met anyone who was so kind, who was so compassionate. He deployed to Iraq in 2011 and was gone for about 10, 10 and a half months. And he was an Apache pilot, um, so he flew, I think it was over 70 missions in the 10 months he was there. A few months after Captain Ian Morrison returned, he began having trouble sleeping. His symptoms spiraled quickly. He stopped working out, one of his favorite things to do. He was anxious. His appetite faded. I think definitely had a hard time coming back. That's what he had said, that you know he, and he understood things when he was deployed. Things made sense. There was order. And he came back and would, you know, went to Walmart and didn't understand why everybody could do anything they wanted. And it seemed so disorganized even said, which was really hard to hear, that I, I miss being there. And he said, I don't miss, like, I want to be with you, but this society doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me anymore. Ian took his life in March of 2012. On the same day, he was diagnosed with depression. I was about a, a week or two away from graduating with a master's in counseling, so I thought I was really aware, you know, and I, I did what I thought was everything I could do to get him care. So, you know, I allowed myself maybe six months to pretty much go crazy and grieve and knock it off the couch. And then I sort of made myself do something every day that gave me air. And so um, I ride my horse a lot. <laughs> I have dogs and I play music and paint. And my faith in God has been a huge, the number one that's pulled me through. Every year I blame myself less for his death. Kim Ruoko's husband took his life nine years ago. She connected with Rebecca through TAPS, the Tragedy Assistance Program for Survivors. Her story is so similar in that her husband was a Apache pilot, also a very religious man, you know, great relationship, and, um, and she's also in the mental health field, as I was. When he knew that he was sick, and he knew that he had depression, he knew that he had post-traumatic stress. That's when he should have got, he should have put his pride aside and gotten help. And I'm, I've, I'm angry at him sometimes for being too proud to get the help. You know, they died by suicide, but they lived great lives. Both Kim and Rebecca work for TAPS now, helping other military suicide survivors. It's, it's very different today, which makes me really hopeful, you know, that we, that we have looked at, what, at these lives that have been lost and made some changes because of them. Kim says there are many more resources available now, like a national crisis hotline and bridge organizations, which help service members who are transitioning out of the military. So many of these guys have been to war and they've been to combat, so a lot of their identity uh, is really closely tied with the military and their combat and their peers and a sense of belongingness that comes with that. And so as they transition in the community and try to have civilian jobs, I'm worried about that factor. She says she also is thinking a lot this year about reservists and the Army and Air National Guards who don't always have the support of a military community. Still, she says the advances of the past decade are encouraging. I think leaders are are much better trained in identifying people at risk um, and knowing you know how to help them and how to connect them to services and peers are much better trained to notice it in each other saving someone's life can't be one person's job so you need to pull in your resources from the community from your family from the unit um, because it's an awful lot for one person to try to do